alaikum everyone, myself Ms. Barrow and I am a student of BOMS First Prof from Jamia Tibya Deopan. Today I am going to tell you about a topic muscle physiology in which we will talk about muscles, its classification, its structure of skeletal muscles and lastly we will end this video with our last topic which is neuromuscular junction. We will start it with our classification of the muscles so we will talk about classification first. Muscles, there are more than 600 muscles in our body which perform various activities and help us doing in things. In muscles are classified by three different methods based on different factors. The three classification bases are one depending upon presence and absence of striation, second depending upon control and third depending upon situation. First, we will talk about our first classification basis which is depending upon presence and absence of striation. Muscles are classified into two categories which is first the striated muscle, second non-striated muscle. Striated muscles are the muscles which has large number of cross striation or transverse line in its structures. And the example of uh, such muscles is skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle is striated muscle. Moving on to non-striated muscles, non-striated muscles are the muscles which do not have any striation or transverse line in its structure. Hence they are known as plain muscles or smooth muscles. These muscles are found in wall of various visceral organs. Second classification basis is depending upon the control. Muscles are classified into two categories again. These are voluntary muscles and involuntary muscles. What are voluntary muscles? Voluntary muscles are those muscles which are controlled by our will. For example, skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle, we can control it by our hand. Suppose, if I need to move something from here to here, I can do it easily by my hand as my hand has skeletal muscles in it, which are voluntary in nature. We can control it by our will. Second is involuntary muscle. Involuntary muscles are the muscles which cannot be controlled by our will. For example, smooth muscles and cardiac muscles. Smooth muscles are uh, involuntary muscles which are present in our heart. We cannot control it by our need, our voluntary control. It cannot be controlled by us. It is involuntary muscles. Second and the last third classification basis is the depending upon situation. The muscles are classified into three categories now. First, the skeletal muscles. Second, the cardiac muscle. Third, the smooth muscles. Skeletal muscles. Skeletal muscles are the muscles which are situated in association with the bones and form skeletal system. Skeletal muscles form 40 to 50 percent of the body mass and they are voluntary and they are striated. They are innervated by somatic nerve fibers. Second, the cardiac muscle. Cardiac muscles form the musculature of the heart and they are involuntary but striated. The other line we can use for cardiac muscle is that Cardiac muscles are functionally similar to the smooth muscle but structurally it is similar to the skeletal muscle. What does it mean? That the cardiac muscle is functionally similar to the smooth muscle because smooth muscle is involuntary in nature and cardiac muscle is involuntary in nature. But structurally it is similar to the skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle is not involuntary in nature, it is voluntary in nature. Smooth muscle. Smooth muscles are situated in association with the visceras and hence they are known as visceral muscles. They are different from skeletal muscles and smooth muscles. They are innervated by autonomic nerve fibers. Smooth muscles form the basic contractile unit of the wall of various visceral organs. Now, if I talk about the structure of skeletal muscles, the mass or tissue is made up of large number of muscle cells or myocytes present in it. Muscle cells are also known as muscle fibers. Muscle fibers are long and cylindrical in appearance. Muscle cells are multinucleated and are arranged parallel to one another with some connective tissue sheath in between. Muscle cells or tissue is separated by another surrounding tissues by a layer of connective tissue, thick fibrous connective tissue that is known as fascia. Beneath the fascia, the muscle is covered by a layer of thin connective tissue that is known as epimysium. Now, epimysium, in, if we talk about the structure, we will go in it. The muscles have, in the muscle, the muscle fibers grouped into bundles or fasciculi and each fasciculi covered by a thin connective tissue sheath that is known as perimysium. 
First one was the epimysium. Here the muscle bundle is covered by another covering that is perimysium. Now moving on to the deepest part that is muscle fiber. Each muscle fiber itself also covered by a connective tissue sheath that is known as endomysium. If you guys notice this is a hierarchy going on. Okay, first it was fascia, then it was epimysium. Epi below epimysium was muscle hole and in the muscle there is muscle bundles which are again covered by perimysium and in the muscle bundle there are muscle fibers which are covered by endomysium. Now if we talk about muscle fiber itself then muscle fiber is cylindrical in shape. Its length is about 3 cm which varies from 1 cm to 4 cm depending upon the length of muscle. Then Skeletal muscle fiber are attached to the cord of connective tissue that is known as tendon. Tendon is itself connected to a bone or attached to a bone and uh, in mu some muscles tendon are thin, flat, stretched out, but tough and these tendons are known as aponeurosis. The muscle fiber again is enveloped by cell membrane or plasma membrane which is present beneath the endomysium. We have discussed it earlier that uh, muscle fiber is enveloped by endomysium and beneath it there is an envelope that is known as plasma membrane or in muscle we use it as plasma lemma. And cytoplasm in muscle is known as sarcoplasm which has many of the cell organelles embedded in them. First nuclei, second golgi, third ribosomes, fourth is myofibrils, and mitochondria and such like that. First if we talk about nucleus then nucleus in all the other cell is situated in the center but here the scenario is different. The nucleus is situated just beneath the sarcolemma and they are multinucleated. Skeletal muscle fiber are multinucleated. They are oval. They can be elongated as well. Now myofibril. Myofibril are thin filament present in the sarcoplasm and in, if we see a cross section of uh, muscle fiber then we will see it as a small distinct dot. Uh, in some muscles these myofibril arrange themselves into groups and that is known as Cohen's area of field. If you talk about sarcomere, sarcomere is the structural and functional unit of muscles and it, we can also say that it is the basic contractile unit of muscle. Sarcomere consists of half I band, one A band and half I band. Sarcomere extends between the two Z lines of myofibril. Each myofibril contains many sarcomere arranged in series. Now if we talk about the microscopic structure of sarcomere. It shows us that there is a presence of some many thread like structure which is known as macrofilament. Myofilaments are basically two, the actin filament and the myosin filament. Actin filament is the thin filament which is attached to its Z line which is present uh, on the either side of the Z line it runs across the I band and enters into A band up to the H zone whereas the myosin filament which is a thick filament it is present in the A band some lateral projections or uh, cross bridges arise from the thick filament or myosin filament and uh, at its tip myosin heads are present these my Suppose this is our actin filament, the thin filament and this is our thick filament, the myosin filament. Myosin filament has some lateral processes. This is the lateral process of myosin filament. This lateral process get attached to the, which has a myosin head on the tip of it. It is a myosin head. It get attached with the actin filament. Actin filament, as soon as it attached with the actin filament, it moves the actin filament towards the center like this. This is myosin and this is actin and here the actin filament is gliding over the myosin filament. Okay, then the H zone which is present between is get shortened and the I band get the actin filament get shortened whereas the myosin filament doesn't move at all. It is a confusing point here that um, does myosin filament move? No, it does not move. Myosin doesn't move from its position. The actin filament glide over the myosin filament and in the contraction process. This mechanism is known as sliding mechanism or racket mechanism. Moving on to our last topic that is neuromuscular junction. Neuromuscular junction is the junction between the 
terminal branch of nerve fiber and muscle fiber. Skeletal muscle fiber are innervated by motor nerve fibers. The axon each nerve fiber divides into many terminal branches and each terminal branches innervate one muscle fibers through neuromuscular junction. Now in this neuromuscular junction we will talk about different um, headings like we haven't studied yet. For example, synaptic trough or gutter, synaptic cleft, presynaptic membrane, the postsynaptic membrane, uh, subneural cleft, we are going to talk about it. First, we are taking the exon terminal or motor end plate, what it is, we'll, I'll tell you about the exon terminal and motor end plate. Terminal branch of nerve fiber is known as exon terminal. When exon come in contact with the muscle fiber, it loses its myelin sheath and so the excess cylinder is exposed. This portion of excess cylinder is expanded like a bulb and known as motor end plate. Second is the synaptic trough or synaptic gutter. The, when the motor end plate invaginate inside the muscle fiber, it forms some depression kind of thing that is known as synaptic trap, synaptic trough or synaptic gutter. And where uh, beneath the motor end plate, the membrane is thickened. Moving on to the presynaptic and the postsynaptic membrane. Presynaptic membrane is the membrane of exon terminal, whereas the postsynaptic membrane is the membrane of muscle fiber. Between these two membranes, the presynaptic membrane and the postsynaptic membrane, there is a gap which is known as synaptic cleft. Exon terminal contains mitochondria and synaptic vesicles. In turn, synaptic vesicle contain some neurotransmitter substance, example, acetylcholine. And mitochondria contain ATP, which is used as the source of energy for the synthesis of acetylcholine. Synaptic cleft contain basal lamina, which is a thin spongy layer of reticular matrix. This basal lamina, through this, uh, extracellular fluid diffuses and large quantity of acetylcholine esterase is attached to the matrix of basal lamina. Now we'll talk about subneural cleft. Subneural cleft are the uh, are present on the postsynaptic membrane, the me membrane of a, uh, muscle fiber. Muscle fibers membrane invaginate. Now moving on, uh, till here we talked about its structure. Ke neuromuscular junction kis chiz se ban raha hai and kis kis ke beech mein ye bond hai. Now we are going to talk about ke ye transmission jo impulse ka ho raha hai from uh, exon terminal to muscle fiber ye kis tarah ho raha hai. So we will talk about neuromuscular transmission. So, the impulse and the action potential generated in the exon terminal will be initiated in the age and further contraction or relaxation will be in the age. So, we will talk about neuromuscular transmission. It is the transfer of information from motor nerve ending to the muscle fiber through neuromuscular junction. It is a mechanism by which motor nerve impulse initiate muscle contraction. Series of events take place in neuromuscular junction during this process. First, release of acetylcholine. Second, the action of acetylcholine. Third, development of end plate potential. Fourth, development of miniature end plate potential. And fifth is the fatal destruction of acetylcholine. First, we are going to talk about release of acetylcholine. Where is it released and how is it released? Which is our synaptic, we have first studied now, that our synaptic vesicles are stored in our neurotransmitter. So, the release process we will discuss it over here that when an action potential reaches exon terminal, it increases the permeability of exon terminal or the presynaptic membrane for calcium ions by opening voltage gated calcium ions channels. What happens is the calcium from the extracellular fluid enters into the presynaptic membrane and calcium causes bursting of synaptic vesicles. What actually calcium does is calcium move and fuses the synaptic vesicles with the presynaptic membranes. Here uh, calcium is playing an important, such an important role because of which our acetylcholine is releasing out. The release of acetylcholine from synaptic vesicles is known as exocytosis. This process is known as exocytosis. Acetylcholine now diffuses from presynaptic membrane and enters into the synaptic cleft. First process में क्या हुआ कि जब हमारी exon terminal पे action potential आई तो उसने generate की कुछ changes हुए कुछ 
वोल्टेज कैल्शियम गेटेड चैनल्स ओपन हुए और परमिबिलिटी बढ़ा दी कैल्शियम की तो एक्स्ट्रा सेलर फ्लूड से कैल्शियम अंदर आ गया एक्जॉन टर्मिनल में एक्जॉन ने बर्स्टिंग करा दी रिलीज करा दिया एसिटाइलकोलिन का और एसिटाइलकोलिन फिर बाहर आ गया साइनेटिक क्लेफ्ट में दैट इज द स्पेस बिटवीन द टू मेमरीज नाउ वील गो टू द सेकेंड पार्ट विच इज द एक्शन ऑफ एस्टाइलकोलिन क्या एस्टाइलकोलिन क्या एक्ट करेगा किस तरह वो करवाएगा चीजें आगे तो वेन द आफ्टर एंटरिंग द साइनेटिक क्लेफ्ट एसिटाइलकोलिन बाइंड विद द receptors which is known as nicotinic acetylcholine receptor present on the post synaptic membrane and forms a complex which is known as acetylcholine receptor complex as soon as the receptor complex is formed it increases the permeability of uh, the post synaptic membrane for sodium ions now the sodium ion from the extracellular fluid comes into the neuromuscular junction as soon as the sodium ion enters into the neuromuscular junction they causes by opening this is not happening ऐसे ही it is happening by a series of things which is going on like if sodium is entering because the ligand gate sodium channels are open and then sodium enters from extracellular fluid into the neuromuscular junction sodium forms uh, produce an action potential that is known as and plate potential moving on to the third step Uh, that is mini uh, end plate po- development of end plate potential development of end plate potential the end plate potential is the charge on the resting membrane that is known as when end plate potential is the charge on the resting membrane potential when an action potential reaches the neuromuscular junction uh, the resting membrane potential at neuromuscular junction is minus 90 millivolt but as soon as the sodium enters in the neuromuscular junction slight depolarization occur and it becomes up to minus 60 millivolt this is known as end plate potential now we we'll talk about miniature end plate potential miniature end plate potential is the potential is a miniature end plate potential is a weak end plate potential which is developed by a small quantity of acetylcholine which is released from the exon terminal however each quanta of acetylcholine is able to generate a miniature end plate potential but miniature end plate potential is not able to produce an action potential when some many more and more quantas of acetylcholine are released all the and produces a miniature end plate potential all the miniature end plate potential are added together and uh, forms action potential or miniature end plate potential now our last thing that is the fate or destruction of acetylcholine destruction of acetylcholine how will it take how it, and what is the significance of it we will talk about that first the release acetylcholine from the synaptic vesicle has to be destructed and has to be destroyed because it would lead to further complication i'll tell you it has to be destroyed within 1 millisecond it is destroyed by acetylcholine esterase enzyme which i told you earlier is present in the synaptic cleft this acetylcholine esterase molecule uh, enzyme will split the acetylcholine into two different parts that is inactive choline and acetate this destruction is important functionally and acetylcholine is so potent then uh, that the short duration of 1 millisecond is enough for it to excite a muscle fiber it has to be destructed ab aisa to nahi hai na ki hamari body mein hamesha hi contraction hoti rahe hum hamesha hi work kar rahe to hamari body ko relax karne ki bhi zarurat padegi lekin hamara acetylcholine kyunki thoda thoda hamesha ban hi raha hai har waqt pe to usko destruct hona zaruri isi liye hai ki hamari body relax kare to isi liye hamara jo enzyme hai acetylcholine which is present in the synaptic cleft will act on it and will destruct it within 1 millisecond cause it is so potent in its work